Hello everyone and welcome back to my KSP tutorial series in Kerbal Space Program 0.90 Beta. In this episode we have missions underway in career mode to Jewel, to Duna and we need to launch a mission to EVE. However I wanted to talk a little bit more about advanced recoverable launcher design and so I've decided to start off in sandbox mode. So we are in sandbox mode, let's make that clear. This is now sandbox mode and so I'm going to use this to talk about uh, some, uh, well, a lot of the things that I did not touch upon in the previous episode with regard to recovering launch stages. So here we have a launch stage and it's it's a pretty good launch stage. We're using this uh, really large Kerbidine KR2L, so very expensive, very powerful engine, right? 20,000 and certainly we want to recover this and we've got plenty of fuel it's got a thrust weight ratio of greater than one. Its thrust is 2,500. Its mass is 213 tons. So it can carry some load. And the question is, uh, what do we need to do to make this recoverable? Right now it's got uh, more than enough thrust weight ratio, but it doesn't have a payload. And the first question is, what kind of payload can we put on it? So let's uh, just talk about that briefly. So what we need to do is to figure out first of all I've already calculated how much fuel we have in here and you could do that by eliminating all the fuel seeing what the mass is and subtracting it out or you can just add up the liquid fuel amounts and divide by 90 so what I did was just add up the liquid fuel amounts in each of these tanks and divide by 90 and I get the total fuel amount is 181.5 tons okay so the question is, uh, with 181.5 tons, what can we uh, get to orbit? What's the payload capacity? So 4,500 is our working number for Delta V2 orbit. And actually what we want to do is we're going to divide out the 9.81 that we always have to add and also the ISP of the engine. The engine in this case has an ISP that runs from 280 to 380. So just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to use the average of those numbers and use 330. And what I get after all that is uh, the, the, I don't know what to call it, the thing before the mass ratio, how about that? So this was 1.39, and then we need to take E to the 1.39 to undo the ln in the rocket equation, right? This is all from the rocket equation. So E to the 1.39 is 4.39. 014. Okay, so that is our mass ratio. What does that mean? Well, it means that the total mass of the rocket is, uh, in order to get 4,500 delta V, is 4.014x, and then we have the fuel amount, and then we have x. x is the empty mass of the rocket. So we know that the whole rocket is going to be 4.014x and so we subtract x from both sides so we subtract it from there and subtracting 1x from here gives us 3.014x and so we know that we divide this by 3.014 and that will give us the empty mass of the rocket that we can uh, have so doing that quickly I find that we get roughly 60 tons of some buffer. So it's actually 60.2, but I'm going to say the empty mass is going to be 60 tons. Okay, well, 60.2, all right. Uh, so what is the empty mass right now? The empty mass of the rocket is 31.5 tons. So payload equals 60.2 minus 30.5 okay and that is 28.7 okay so then that's the payload capacity for this right now but it's missing a lot of things right we're missing batteries we're missing parachutes uh, we'll need a decoupler but we'll just add that into the payload mass uh, we need landing struts I, and can this land well let's take a look at this this is now empty of fuel so this is in landing configuration and the center of mass is here. Do you think this is going to be stable on landing if the center mass is that high? Probably not. 
when you think about where the landing struts are going to go, let's let's uh, put some tentative landing struts in. Okay, so we need to extend below this engine, which is a tough thing to do. Oh, that's not that's not going to be good, right? This is definitely going to tip over. Uh, and even if we let's say slip in a reaction wheel at the top, that's a good thing to do. Consider that a necessity. So there's obviously a controller, and there's a reaction wheel, and yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna tend to tip over. Right. So how do we fix that? Well, there are a few ways. First of all, don't build it so tall to begin with. But we want a heavier payload. In fact, we could do with a heavier payload. And of course, we have a lot of things to add right now, and we need to somehow add parachutes to the top. How many parachutes do we need? Well. If we've got a mass of 33.6, assuming that you're going to reserve a little bit of fuel for retroburn, we have to get all the way to orbit anyway, so we're going to need to retroburn, and that means we're going to have a little bit of fuel to touch down with to slow our descent. You can get away with less parachutes if you can slow your descent somehow, but in general we are talking about uh, basically half of your empty mass worth of parachutes. So uh, if we've got an empty mass of 34 tons, uh, estimate, uh, just as a first ballpark figure, 17 parachutes. Okay, we, we now have 18 parachutes, all nice and neat right there. But we, and uh, now our total mass is 36.3 tons, but we haven't resolved the center mass issue. In fact, we've probably moved the center of mass a little bit higher thanks to the parachutes. Uh, one other thing we need is we need battery power. And in general, you'll need at least 400 charge in order to bring it down on the next orbit. So if, if you plan to go for more than, well, yeah, if you plan to go for more than one orbit, then you got to need more. But one orbit, uh, 400 should be fine. I usually go with 800. Here's 600. So it's like that. Okay. But this is not good enough. Again, we've got the center mass issue. We need to widen the base somehow. As a first uh, first estimation, the distance between the center of mass and the bottom of the vehicle, or the landing struts, wherever they happen to be. If the landing struts are higher, just measure from the center of mass to the landing struts, wherever they are. But uh, you really can't get the landing struts much higher because you can't scale them up more than this. So this distance versus this distance, the distance across the vehicle from one landing strut to another is what you're interested in. And the ratio of that is what will decide whether this is stable or not. Um, that's, that's not entirely true uh, because you could have so much reaction wheel power that you could overdo that. I mean, you could just dump a whole lot of reaction wheels. You could dump, uh, you could add RCS to this you could add Werner engines to keep stability. That's another option. So if you have these all the way around and use them, they're going to burn the liquid fuel and oxidizer. You can use them to keep this stable. But let's say you wanted to create something innovative, uh, something that looks really good. There is an option for you. There is a flaw to this big engine that we've got here, right? This This is a very powerful engine, very very useful in vacuum. This is a good vacuum engine because it's got 380 ISP in vacuum. But it's got only 280 at sea level. It's not a very good sea level engine. So what we want is sea level engines. How are we going to attach those? Well, you could just... Uh, now remember, we can't decouple them because we intend to recover everything. You can slap on boosters later if you'd like. So we can't use decouplers. We're eventually going to have to directly place the engines on the side and so the thing you would probably guess to do is uh, something like this maybe more tanks and such and we're eventually going to put some mainsails or some skippers because the skippers have 320 at sea level the mainsails have 320 at sea level and so they have the right number for us to launch with so let's say we put the mainsails right now this is way overpowered because we've got uh, the equivalent amount to lift 850 tons, including this engine. Now we could start this engine turned off, in which case we have enough to lift 600 tons. That's still quite a lot, 
So we could be adding a lot more fuel to this than we've got right now. Or we could attach the mainsail engines to larger fuel tanks. So instead of using those, we could start off with these. And perhaps there's some way of smoothing out the lines there without overburdening things. We could use the same adapter we used here. Um, at least it carries fuel. And also it'll keep uh, the engines a good distance away from this. So we could do something like this. If you don't like that look, we can use the this adapter flipped around. And now you have little pods like that. And now we're getting closer to the 600 tons we're talking about, but it's very ugly, isn't it? Okay, so we've, we've got a, sort of a aesthetic issue with our lander. That's one thing. We also will eventually put the... So if we do that, we're going to put the lander legs on those outside ones. And that'll extend the base, make the base wider, so that we don't have to worry about this. Also, if you notice, um, let's bring... Uh, let me undo... Okay. So uh, now we've got all this stuff on the side here, and it's a wider base, and now the distance between this and this versus from side to side is not too bad. But also, if we lower the fuel out of this, dump all the fuel, the center mass is also lower because we've got more engines at the bottom. These are heavy engines, and so it brings the center mass down. If the fuel that we have left is actually in these bottom ones. You can see that helps even more. What we don't want is the fuel that is left over being in the top one. That is not good. Uh, think about fuel feeding. Uh, the fuel feeds from the first tank first. Uh, once you add fuel lines, it's more complicated. So automatically, this engine is going to draw from this tank first. So that's exactly what we want, actually. So uh, we want them to draw from the top tanks first, and so uh, be careful how you use the fuel lines. Uh, they'll be drawing things at f as far away from them as possible. Probably you'll want to attach this bomb tank to here so that the top... If you're going to be feeding fuel from these outer pods in, you're going to want to go like that. And then, then it'll draw from the top first. But then you're going to end up with a lot of fuel here. It'll draw from this outside tank first, and then it'll start on this center. So that's something to think about. But that's sort of what we want, because the, we want this engine to keep running in vacuum. Okay, but this does not look good. So, one trick I often use is with these guys, tail connectors. For instance, uh, one thing I often do is, not on this sort of design, but in general, you can put the LVT45s on them, and so you can place them like this, or if you need a little bit more fuel, you could add one of these fuel tanks, and then add the LVT45s. So you can uh, create sort of a cluster effect like that. So if you want instead eight of them, you can create a Falcon 9 very easily like this. So these tail connectors are essential in making really nifty little designs, but we need more engine power than the LVT45s. Maybe we do want to extend using these tanks first, so that's good, but we need bigger engines, so we're going to need to widen that out a bit. Uh, do we have a part that can do that? Well, we do have a structural part that can do that. We also have fuel tanks that can do that. We have these. Now this is overlapping, so that's not good. But there are numerous ways of fixing that. One is tilting out like so. So let's say these tilted out, but that tilting out that much doesn't look good and the tail connectors start clipping. So let's be a little bit more subtle about this. Let's use our rotate tool and rotate out here. 
it's just about right. Maybe rotate these a little bit more. First thing I want to minimize the clipping. Now when we add the fuel tanks, let's say we add these. Okay, so that's that's pretty powerful looking, isn't it? Uh, we can now place them a little bit higher. We should probably remove those parachutes for now because they're sort of getting in the way of the design. Okay, but this doesn't. We we don't need eight main sails at the bottom, right? Certainly not. That's too many. What we could use is maybe. Well, what we really need is the landing struts at the bottom of these. That's the main thing. But, but how about four? So now we've got four main sails there, but we don't have the mass. We only have fuel in here, though. So let's make sure we've got everything loaded up with fuel. Okay, now we're getting a good mass here. I think I've given you some ideas about what to do. One other thing you can do is if you decide you need more fuel, you can add more of these pods and just get rid of the engines. And so now we've got 600 tons, lots of fuel, and you can add the fuel ducts to run the fuel from these other pods into the ones with the mainsails. Now, when we add the girder segments, and perhaps more girder segments if necessary, but let's just uh, let's just look at it like this. Keep in mind you're gonna need more parachutes, by the way. And eight legs are better than just four. So now, when we dump the fuel out. Okay, so now the center mass is here, the bottom of the vehicle, well, let's say the landing strut uh, pivot point is here, and so that's that distance, but now we've got a really wide base. And I would expect that this thing would be, well, certainly more stable than the, than the other version, and probably stable altogether. If it's not stable, probably not using SAS right. Let me quickly figure out how much this can lift. Okay, so my initial estimate payload, based on an ISP of 335 now, um, and we've got 501.5 tons of fuel. Uh, but based on that, my estimate payload is 65.2. Keep in mind, though, that we don't have enough parachutes right now. And also, we'll need to reserve some fuel for landing, for uh, return and landing. So... Probably we are not going to be able to slap on enough parachutes on this in order to uh, recover it without some engine thrust. Uh, considering that we'll need probably more than 50 parachutes to do that. So yeah, we're going to need substantial engine thrust, probably save on the parachute mass. and uh, But a very, very significant payload, even if we have to reserve some fuel. We don't have to res reserve too much. It's only a little bit... Um, yeah, we can talk more about that later, but you get the idea. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, using the these little uh, tail connectors, this is basically what they're for. I, I never use them for anything else except for connecting things radially like this. I sometimes do aircraft as well. Um, yeah, and just widen the base. That's basically the main thing in terms of recoverable design. We're not going to test this out right now. I think it is time to return to our career mode and we are going to continue on with those missions. Okay, so now we're back in cute little career mode and I have decided that it is time to start introducing mods. Not mods that affect gameplay in any fundamental way like Fair Mirror Space that's a fundamental change to the game or Deadly Reentry is a fundamental change to the game. Uh, nor any part mods, because those are even further down the road as far as I'm concerned. But first of all, we need to introduce the mods that are just basic utilities. Sort of like next step up from calculator and notepad. So we've, we, I've already been using calculator and notepad, right? So these are sort of basic things. 
And so, sort of the next step up from that, somebody suggested that I should uh, add Curb Alarm Clock. In fact, Curb Alarm Clock is pretty much the mod that gets recommended most uh, when it comes to uh, my videos. They, uh, people always in the comments mention Curb Alarm Clock. And that is because I tend to do things like we've been doing recently, which is uh, launching lots and lots of missions, right? So I've got a mission with uh, Duna Landing here. So, uh, and then a mission with uh, Jewel Flyby, right? That's our mission out there. Uh, probably more than a flyby, but we'll see how much Delta V we've got when we get there. And we're planning another mission, which is to Eve, right? So we've got all these missions, and what you can do is you can configure alarms. So here's our Jewel probe, and let's say that before it gets to Jewel, I want to make sure it warns us. Well, okay, here, Jewel Probe. So, Alarm Jewel Probe, and this is SOI Change Alarm. It's exactly what we want. This is the alarm for the Sphere of Influence change, and it knows already that the time to SOI is three, uh, 236 days, and so all I need to do is add alarm. Okay, so uh, the, the other alarms are, there's a raw time alarm, and we could just uh, make any random alarm that we want. There's a maneuver node alarm, and so if I create a maneuver node here, voila, it uh, immediately sees that maneuver node and you can add an alarm for that. Or, since that's not really a maneuver I'm planning on doing, I'll just get rid of that. Oh, wrong one. SOI change alarm. Okay, uh, closest approach distance. So if you want to get the alarm for when you're closest to a target, if you're trying to rendezvous with a target, that is an important alarm. And the key thing with Curve Alarm Clock is it will slow you down and stop your time warp when you get close to these alarms. And that is something we have to configure. Uh, where is that option? Okay, alarm defaults. Default margin, one minute. I think that's the, this is the kill warp, yeah. So this is kill warp and message, default margin one minute. So one minute before the alarm, uh, I think we probably need like three minutes before the alarm is better for me. So I'm gonna say three minutes and uh, then it's going to kill warp and send a message or if you want, uh, you can say kill warp and don't give me a message. That's an option, message only, no effect on time warp, do nothing. <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend do nothing. Pause game and message is pretty serious stuff. Um, maybe we should go with kill warp and send a message since I'm just showing how this stuff works. That's the default anyway. So by default it will do it one minute before we get there. So we've got that alarm set up. Let's go back to tracking station and set up an alarm for the Duna one. I'm not sure we actually have to jump to the vessel, but probably. Anyway, uh, Kerbal Duna landing. Now we've got three minute margin by default. And, uh, yeah, or you could change it here if you think you need more. You don't need to change the default setting. But uh, that's fine. Time to SOI. No, no. Oh, uh, this hasn't exited Kerbin yet. Ah, that's a problem. So right now it's still on its route out from Kerbin. It hasn't reached the interplanetary SOI. So let me just time warp out of this SOI so it doesn't warn me for this one. Be careful about that though. Actually, we don't have to be careful about that. Let me add the alarm. I'm going to go full time warp. And you'll notice it's going to automatically slow me down as we get close to the SOI change. Okay, and then it warns me. Uh, we've got three minutes to the SOI change. I close the alarm. And time warp is halted, but I can time warp all on my own. That's fine. And so I time warp right through the SOI change, which, you know, you should be careful about. And now we're in general SOI. I get rid of this message. Now we're en route to Duna as planned, with an Ike encounter there too. And now I'm going to add the alarm for that. Okay, already configured for me, no problem. Now, uh, just to clarify, I don't usually use Curb Alarm Clock, and that is, that's just a thing of mine. 
but uh, it's obviously very handy as you can see. So especially when conducting numerous missions, we've got the Jewel mission, this mission, and then I'm going to do the Eve mission. And yeah, it's obviously very useful. Let me go to the tracking station and get the phase angle for Eve, and then we'll talk about that mission. Now, this is one of the things I definitely don't want to use in Kerbal Alarm Clock. Uh, it is the thing that uh, lets you figure out the transfer windows without thinking about it. Uh, so transfer origin, we want Kerbin, and we, we our target is Eve. You can see it gives you automatically the phase angle, tells you what the phase angle currently is. And so if you really want to, you never have to calculate phase angles, you never have to think about it, you just figure out where your origin is, where your target is, make sure the parent is correct. Sometimes you want to transfer from different moons of Joule, so you'll change the parent to Joule and go on with that. But here you go, uh, you can add an alarm and as usual just time warp. And there you go, it's slowing us down in terms of time warping and we now have a Kerbin to Eve transfer point. Uh, takes some of the fun out of it honestly. But anyway, there you go. You can do that now. So Kerbal Alarm Clock has made it easy for you. You never have to calculate or look up or do anything with phase angles ever again. <sighs> and we're probably going to do more of that. Uh, we're we're going to have some of these utilities that do the calculation for you. The calculation it does is the same as the calculation that you would have to do that I introduced in previous episodes. So that's basically the idea of it. And before people start giving me suggestions on other mods to cover, I am going to introduce Kerbal Engineer, even though I don't use it. Uh, again, Kerbal Engineer is going to calculate the delta V's for you, so you never have to get out a calculator again, and you never have to calculate delta V's. Though Kerbal Engineer cannot calculate the the maximum payload of a rocket for you, you're going to have to know the rocket equation in order to figure that out. Um, I don't think it can work backwards like that for you. So, yeah. So Kerbal Engineer is a thing. Of course, you could just guess and check and just throw payloads on there until your, your Delta V is too low. So I guess you could do it that way. But, yeah, Kerbal Engineer. I'm going to go over the beautification mods, like, uh, you know, like uh, Environmental Visual Enhancements, which adds clouds. And uh, we're going to have um, Chatterer, which adds little voices for the Kerbals. So those sorts of things first, and then we'll go on to more fundamental mods after that. So I'll, I'll cover them one at a time mostly. All right, so Kerbal Alarm Clock. We now know what that does. I'm sure there are even more features that I haven't even bothered looking at. But uh, yep, you can experiment with that. I... I think we should base our Eve and Gilly landers on the Jewel probe. All right, so how do we adapt this in order to become a lander? It's not too hard. We've got parachutes on it already, so that means that it's ready for Eve. It's not coming back from Eve though, so all we really need is lander legs. And voila, we now have an Eve lander. And the Gilly Lander, presumably. Uh, we could do one more thing that I thought of, and that's because when you've got a lander, you actually don't want the solar panels to be facing like this. This is not a good direction for the solar panels if you've got a lander rather than a flyby mission. Okay, there we go. I think this is more like what I want for solar panels that are gonna feed a vessel that's gonna land somewhere. They're upward facing. Still got these four. Okay. Large boosters are about a little bit more than twice the cost of the smaller ones. We could double up the struts. Yeah, let's let's just add more landing struts. I don't know about clearance though. Okay, we could try something like that out. 
Okay, so here we go. Throttle up. SAS on. Huh, all right. I'm a little bit uh, off because I started off in sandbox mode and now I'm back in career mode. I just need to get my mindset proper. Okay, throttle down. Oh yeah, this had that problem. This mass might be too much. Right, 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 right. Now I remember. Now after I launch, I remember what the problem was. <laughs> Okay. We're gonna have to start turning early. Ooh, ow, ooh! Oh, fudge. Okay, well that's not good. All right. Well, we'll 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 just land this thing. Okay, just don't hurt the facilities, please. Okay. Going to use thrust to slow down a bit. I don't know why the launch clamps always make that sound. All right, let's recover this thing. <sighs> so upside, we got 10,000 back at least. Uh, downside, we lost the other 30 or so thousand. Probably more like 40,000. Do, like, uh, do I have stock bug fix modules in here? Let me, let me quit out and check that. That seemed to be a stock bug fix module issue. And I keep forgetting... I've got, I've got about... 24 different installs of Kerbal Space Program and uh, this is only one of many many series and then many many other things I'm doing so I keep forgetting where I put the stock bug fix modules in particular installs so let me go out and check. Okay so no I did not have the stock bug fix modules installed now I do but the question is whether they do what I think they're gonna do do I risk my valuable funds to see if these boosters are going to separate properly this time? Going to mount them a little bit lower. Going to thrust limit them a little bit too so that we don't have to throw down the center engine as much. Okay, so uh, I've installed the stock bug fix modules and we're going to see if that's good enough to uh, keep this going proper. Uh, it's just an experiment and it's a costly one, but uh, it's one I'm going to undertake. Alright, so let's try this out. After all, it's important to know whether your bug fix modules actually fix your bugs. So, throttle is up, SAS is on, laying the main engine and launch. So now we can keep uh, the main engine running at full steam while this is going. And we should have a better ascent profile. Alright, here we go. Alright, okay, stock bug fix module. So, uh, consider it an additional mod, maybe not. It's just bug fixes, you should always throw them in. And it is only because I've, I don't know. I don't know why I keep forgetting to throw them in. Some sort of mental block. Going to 100 here. Alright. Let's hope we have enough fuel left over. Stage only. Not much. Not a whole lot at all. The lander looks positively replete, replete with fuel by comparison. All right, that should do. 
all in the dark. It's not the best way to go, but all right. Throw those off. Mission underway. Okay, so the mission is free. And now let's try and land this back, see if more lander legs does the trick or not. I think we are a little bit... I don't know, I think the peninsula is a little bit further away. We're actually a little bit behind it, if you like, uh, to the west of it. So I'm going for 27 kilometers instead. Alright, here we go. You can see the 800 electric charge that I've put on and uh, you'll note that I had recommended 400 electric charge but that's obviously quite a lot in this case however uh, your electric charge consumption might be a lot more if you have a larger launcher like we were doing in the sandbox mode so uh, if for the, that sort of larger launcher you're probably gonna have more powerful reaction wheels your probe core might take up more energy and stuff like that so um, so yeah, that's why I recommended about 400 for a single orbit go around. And besides, you might might take some time to adjust things. There's also inclination issues. You might need to adjust your inclination if, for some reason, you toss it into an inclined orbit. Maybe you've got a station in an inclined orbit, or you're trying to reach Minmus. Uh, those would be reasons why you might end up with your launcher inclined and if your launcher is inclined you need to correct that before trying to land it at the KSC you're going to need to reduce its inclination to zero first I think we're going to end up a little bit low maybe that'd be a rarity for me but uh, the mark is what altitude we cross the coastline of the home continent and again, I'm aiming for 34 kilometers on that. Yep, I would say we're probably coming in short. Probably 27 was going a bit too far on that. Should have gone like 28.5, 29-ish. Um, we might hit the mountains at this rate. Yes, that seems to be the case. Hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to deploy the parachutes ahead of time to make sure that we don't get too close to the mountains and probably going to do that. No, I think we got to land short of the mountains. But we've got some highlands here. Can't do anything about that now. Trouble with trying to aim at the KSC in the dark. And remember, I'm not really aiming at the KSC. I mean, actually, my retro burn aim point is that peninsula. So planting a flag at the KSC really doesn't help on that. I could see the KSC just fine on the map. It was the peninsula that I aimed for that I couldn't see properly. Anyway, parachutes. I guess this will be a real test of whether this is recoverable or not. Our terrain is not particularly friendly. Somebody reminded me that I should turn off and on the SAS before touchdown, and that's true, because SAS is going to be trying to hold it to some weird angle, and that might tip it over. So actually I'm going to turn off SAS now, let the whole thing drift towards retrograde, and then only once I get close to touchdown will I turn it back on again. So, lots of input from comments for this episode. I have taken them into advisement. Okay, full parachute deployment brings us to 8.5. It's not good enough. And the ground is about 1,000, judging from where the parachute's fully deployed. Can't really see the ground all too well. Oh, it's tipping, it's tipping. Uh, let me... Oh! You know, it sort of stopped tipping there, but I wouldn't trust it. But then again, it was uneven ground. If we were landing at the KSC, I think it would have been solid. Anyway, I'm not gonna apologize for recovering funds. We need these funds. Especially after the disaster earlier. So, we recovered that. 27,000 funds. About 
a little bit more than half of our value. Now let's transfer that mission to Eve. We also need to launch a ghillie mission. I might do that uh, on a second go around. Wait till because we've got the jewel mission is gonna take a while. So got 219 days. By 219 days, Eve will come around for a second pass. So we'll do Eve first, and then we'll do Gilly on a second pass instead of doing them both at the same time. Probably for the best. Okay, I don't know. Have I done an Eve transfer in this? I don't know. So let me let me show how that works out. So normally for the outer planets, we would actually make the maneuver node here. But for the inner planets, Eve and Moho, we make the maneuver node 180 degrees from that, so over here. And we want our trajectory heading backwards, like this. And as you'll see as we zoom out, that brings our orbit in. This is already too far, but we've already done quite a lot there. So we see... The beginnings of uh, encounter there and that's convenient because it's at the ascending node what that means is that because that's where our orbit will cross Eve's orbit we don't have to correct inclination if it was hitting over here we'd have to correct inclination over here first to make course adjustment but if we can fix that so you saw the first thing I did was and in fact we could get an encounter right there yeah I, I do like this transfer We'll probably still do a mid-course plane change to get closer than 15 point, uh, 15,500 kilometers. But I think this is alright. Okay, I think it'll take about this amount of time to do this burn. Let's see. Yep, uh, this will be about half the delta V on this side of the maneuver node and half on the other side. Now, I had made that maneuver node, and if I wanted to have Kerbal Alarm Clock make the... You can see it already had maneuver node alarm. It already knew that I had maneuver node, and that was the next thing I would want. And so it already had that all going for us. It's a very smart little mod. Um, I think there is a setting somewhere in this lot where you can have it automatically alarm you when you have a maneuver node. Ah, here we go. Detect and add alarms for maneuver nodes. So, what this will do is, whenever you have a maneuver node, it'll, uh, it'll add the alarm for you automatically. Okay, and uh, same as Sphere of Influence, you can have it detect and add those alarms automatically. Prob oh, that contract alarms might be helpful. But I think the only one that you would want to have detected and added automatically is probably the maneuver node alarms. Though I sometimes find that annoying, so I'm going to leave that off. Obviously, you don't have to keep the window open. It's going to pop up with messages whenever there's some event that you need to take care of. So you can just keep it closed. Oh, one thing that comes to mind about that big launcher that we uh, saw in the sandbox mode in the beginning, I should mention that you should add struts to that. Those outer pods uh, with the mainsails, yeah, you'll you'll want to strut those to the main body a little bit. Otherwise, they're going to, or or to each other as well, because otherwise you can have problems there. Okay, there's our encounter. And now that I'm not tweaking the maneuver nodes, the maneuver node tweaking. Uh, is great and all, but it's better to actually see what's going on. And so we actually get it to a better periapsis than we could just tweaking the maneuvers. I'm sure somebody's gonna recommend precise node at some point. I'm not a big fan of that. I may or may not cover it. I don't think it's strictly necessary. Curve alarm clock, if you're doing complicated things, probably could be considered necessary. Alright, so this probe is now on its way to EVE, so curve alarm clock, let us add, and it, it knows. But actually this is the, the SOI change out of curve and sphere of influence, so I'm going to time warp, th well, okay, I'm going to add that alarm, time warp right through it. Okay, pop up, delete, I can select delete on close so I don't have to press the X mark, so that's done. If you're not looking at it, you'll probably want to click delete on close on that. 
Okay, so now I can time up a little bit more to get out of this SOI. Alright, now I will add the SOI change and that will tell me when it gets to Eve. Okay, so this has been an intro to some elements of advanced recoverable launcher design and also Kerbal Alarm Clock. Alright, so uh, with that we have three missions in a way, the jeweled uh, uh, Kerbal Duna landing mission and this Eve mission, and I will continue those in the next episode. So, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.